everybody. It's DB Frick. It's Welcome Back to America. Thanks for checking us out again this week. We've got a lot of show in store for you. So much. We're going back to England again. The one with England. And I'm going to introduce someone who was nice enough to come back on our show this season. Ladies and gentlemen, the great monarch herself, the ruler, the Queen of England, no. Queen Elizabeth II. No. Oh, no. Oh, no, that's Star Wars. I'm sorry. That's not one of those. Good to what? Thank it's, you for coming. Oh, you're welcome. Over here, this way. Oh, it's, this way. It's good to this be way. here. Hey. Cheers. Oh, you brought a drink again? That's good. Mm. I'm always thirsty. Yeah, you're always drinking gin, I hear. I'm, uh, yes, I am. It's really nice to have you back on a show where we're going to talk about England. This is great. Thanks for coming in. Oh, my. You look great. Oh. I love your cape and your crown. Your hair's looking good. Yeah, humidity. Are those pearls? Because those are huge. Pearls. No, they're not pearls. What do you think they are? They are pearls. Of course. I'm sorry. Stupid question. Stupid question, your queenliness. Yes. Now, there's a lot going on in the mm. monarchy. There's, mm. a lot of, uh, there's a lot of gossip, as always. Yes. We are at a precipice. Of the monarchy right now, you are 95. I your am husband, 93. You're 93. Oh, so, I know, I'm 94. Sorry, you're going to be 95. You got your husband, Prince Philip. He's going to be 100 June 10th. He's got his, I mean, that's crazy. You've got another jubilee coming up. You've got so much. I you got so much. Harry and Meghan causing trouble. <laughs> yeah, uh, they're uh, your, your grandson. Do you have a, and they have grand, you have, yeah. Yeah. Megan. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, we know, I know you have a lot prepared for us. Millie Michaels is on sabbatical. She's not here tonight. So She's a lovely girl. Lovely, 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 lovely lady, girl. that Millie. Love her to death. But uh, you, uh, you have some stuff you'd like to tell I us do, about. I do, and I brought pictures with me. Oh, that's great. You brought I some did. pictures? Ooh, yeah, so there's a picture I brought of my map to show you how lucky I am. That's nice. How wonderful to be me. This is the locations of my castles, my palaces, my yachts, my polo area, just everything. Just so good, and it's beautiful. It's a lot of places for one place to live on one island. That's... I'm very lucky. You are very lucky. You're very lucky to be married as long as you. Cheers. Wish I had my own drink. I don't. We don't usually drink alcohol yeah. on the I'm show. the queen. I'm the queen. You do what you want. So I want to say, if Prince Philip and I, we know each other since I'm 13 and he's 18. Wait, wait, 13 uh, and 18 you started seeing each other? No, we were, just, we were friends. We were friends. I had the crush. He was 18. He didn't know I was around. Well, oh, okay. maybe. But uh, he loved me no matter what. I, you know, even though I was just a common princess, an ordinary girl, he still married me, and I became the queen after. Yes. Yes. It is amazing how you ascended to the throne. And we've had a torrid love affair ever since. 73 years, I 74 think? years. Sorry, wow, 74 yes, years. He loves me. It's a long time to have sex with any one person. Mm, it's a good time. What else you got going well, on Prince in England? Well, Philip, like you said, he's going to be turning 100. It's crazy. And um, I just hope he makes it. He was just in the hospital. And yeah. yeah. Is he doing good? Is he doing well? Mm, he's okay? doing better, but I told him if he dies, I will have to stuff him like a prized bear and get a footman to put him on a dolly so he can accompany me to all these celebrations I have coming up. I mean, in, in 2022, I have my Platinum Jubilee. That's crazy. I know. 75 years? No, 70 years of being 70 a monarch. Years, wow. I'm the only one who's ever going to achieve it. No, no, nobody else. Will. And um, so, I mean, I will have to push him around. But there's going to be parades, and oh, there's yeah. going to be uh, public uh, pomp and circumstance. Celebration. Look at the people, they love me. You know, block parties, you Americans say. And then Buckingham Palace, we have a lovely concert that everybody. Oh, that's my yacht. That's nice. really the dinghy of my yacht. You call it the dinghy. <laughs> yes, and it's just a blockbuster weekend. Look at concerts. At the, everybody's invited. You should come. I will. It's a lot Thank of you fun. for the invite. That yes. means a lot. Dibby, come. It's a blockbuster weekend. It's DB. It's not Dibby. Okay. DB. So listen, this is very important, everybody. Uh, I want everyone to know that the royals, we, we support the LGBTQ community. We do. We all do. My cousin, Ivor Mountbatten, 
and he was the first royal to come out of the cupboard. Oh, yeah, it'd be interesting to know where he is in the ascension to the throne, like where he is in line. Yeah, well, he's in the bathroom line. He's oh, okay. not going on the throne. Okay, fair and, enough. And, uh, well, he's going he on the other married throne. James Coyle back in 2018. And they that, look very happy together. That was a lovely wedding reception. I never danced so much in my life. I learned this one. YMCA. Let me do it one more time. Or it's raining men. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, it's raining men. Oh, that would really suck in the studio if <laughs> men were just falling. Oh, Ooh, God. Let's drink to that. We'll drink to that. Ooh. Anything else going on in England? Any other? Yes, yes, yes. We have uh, any other gossip? I want to still talk about with the LGBTQ yes. people. That, you know, Prince Harry, he really supports the transgender youth with his I understand that. different charities. And, you know, Prince William just loves the gay community rainbow paper so much. Look how happy he is. You give him rainbow and he's just, he's lovely. I love him. It's nice to see uh, Prince William happy. Yes. So now, uh, terrible news is I heard that Meghan and Harry were going to be interviewed by Oprah for 90 minutes. Really? Us royals didn't even know that Meghan could speak. <laughs> oh, that's a funny 90, joke. Yeah. 90 minutes was going, Harry, you better get ready for that. But, uh, you know, I wonder what they're going to talk about. What? About how they're quitters. Ooh. Or maybe how they take the children to Burger King and not to see Gam Gam, the queen. Oh, wow. Yeah. You, someone's bitter. Yeah, well, you know, uh, uh, is there a picture of Megan? I want you just to, st there's a picture of Megan. Look at the face. She's very cheeky. Like, Harry's like, oh, my gosh, my Gam Gam. I'm worried about her. But Megan's like, ooh, I don't care about Gam Gam. I'm going to L.A. And uh, anyway, I just want you to know, Megan, dear, that I am distantly related to Vlad the Impala. I've heard that. A.K.A. Dracula. Yeah. <laughs> so be careful, Megan. <laughs> oh, he Very looks much. a little bit like uh, the baby she has now. Oh, wow, that's very mean. It's the mustache mostly in mm, the hat. I think that, who's that, what's his name? Archie. Archie, yes, your grandson Archie. Mm. Uh, Queen Elizabeth II, thank you so much for coming down to the show. Oh, my pleasure, Dan Dan DB. <laughs> yeah. We have so much coming at you. We got Jordan Gray from Comedy Central UK show Transaction. Oh, he's so, so lovely. funny. She's, oh, so, she's, she's, she's so great. Funny. She's lovely. very funny. We also have Elliot James, oh. who wrote a book called The Importance of Happiness. Mm. And he's coming on. We're going to talk about Monty Python and British comedy and his book and all that stuff. And he's kind of like Richard Chamberlain. Yeah, yeah. he's a Richard yeah. Chamberlain type. Yeah. So stay tuned for all of that. And Ooh. welcome back to America. Cheers. Thanks for checking us out. Cheers. 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 What is wrong with you? Get a drink next time. What we is don't wrong drink with on you? the show. I do. At least visibly. What do you have? What do you mean? It's a wet bar. Oh, oh nice. Oh, boy, where are we going? Okay, I'm scared. It is DB Frick, back with Welcome Back to America once again. Thanks for checking out the show. We have something really special for you tonight. This, uh, this person is incredibly funny. I just watched some scenes from a show that she's doing on Comedy Central UK called Transaction. And it all takes place uh, from the point of view of uh, someone who's transsexual. And it's at a supermarket at night, sort of, and it's so funny. And I'm looking forward to chatting about with uh, them right now. Jordan Gray, thanks for coming down to the show. Thanks for coming to Welcome Back to America. 
Thank you so much for having me, DB. This is this is fantastic. Here we are communicating through the medium of a couple of rectangles. Look at us go. <laughs> We're not even people anymore. We don't even exist. With geometric illusions. <laughs> I like to first get into what got you into performance. Were you a stage actor first? Did you go straight into film and TV? What first got you into it? You know what, it's such an unusual trajectory. I was a, a singer for many years, piano and, and music. I had a lovely career in music, uh, did Europe, and I never got as far as America, you know, fingers crossed one day. Um, and then I did some reality TV. Uh, there was a program over here called The Voice. I believe you have The Voice. We have The Voice UK. Everything is that little, uh, extra little bit on the end. And uh, after that, I released a single and I thought it was rubbish. And I realized that I'd fallen out of love with <laughs> the idea of making pop music. So I, I moved into stand-up comedy and from there things rocketed. And uh, we have a fantastic scene over here in terms of going from a, being a comedian to being a television personality. There's quite a well-established trajectory there. So uh, it's happened very quickly. That was only a few years ago, I moved into comedy and, and now, um, and now I'm very lucky to do it on TV. Where would you do uh, stand-up? What are some of the venues that you were able to get to? Well, you know, because because I'm a, a transgender individual, I, I perform at lots of prides, like all the time. Before comedy did prides, so all I did was I said, "Well, I don't do music anymore. I do comedy. Can I come and tell some jokes on your stage to all your lovely gay people?" And they're like, "Yeah, <laughs> that'd be great." So, but I'm. It's they're not really. It's. I, I, I don't tailor my comedy towards the LGBT community. So a lot of it just kind of goes over people's heads. Uh, so it's, it's a hard lesson to learn that audience is sort of very different all over the place. I assume that all the LGBT people would think I was hilarious, but it's a hard lesson to learn that you actually so you have, have this, to put some effort in. You have this musical background. Have you written any funny songs sort of? Yeah. Yeah. That's my whole, like I'd say about 70%. Okay. Uh, I say Tim Minchin, who can compare themselves to the great Tim Minchin? But yeah, sort of wordy piano comedy. That's great. Um, if you could have uh, one superhero power, what would it be? I will quite like Dominion over insects, because I think it's sort of very niche. And they're always about, they're, they're, there's probably a few buzzing around in here. And it's like, you know, people ask you that question and you, Usually you should just have an answer prepared because they usually only ask because they want to tell you what theirs is. But I, I thought really not. What would yours be? Have you well, have you told direct, your listeners? You actually picked the thing that is like direct opposite. I'm most afraid of insects. So oh, you, no. you would be the villain in my <laughs> story. So you, that's so funny that you would always be trying to bring insects into my life. That's my fear. If I had a superhero power, um, probably to be thinner. Well, uh, at will, in terms yeah. of it, you could yeah. contract and expand like Mr. Fantastic. Oh, that's, yeah. that's admirable. I like but, that. Look. But to suit any social situation. <laughs> like, so I okay. can the right weight for whatever situation <laughs> I'm in. Um, yeah, so if you're, if you're ever so slightly too uh, svelte, you can expand yourself if you want to get a role, for example, in a mainstream right. American sitcom as the husband. You just make exactly. you just expand and then, then it's yours. Okay. Because there's a certain amount of weight with, like, you can be a certain amount of weight and then up to a point, they won't hire you for anything until you're so big that they'll yeah. hire you for things yeah. and you can get work. Um, what are some, you, you've been doing this show for a show called Transaction. You have uh, several episodes on Comedy Central UK. I just watched three of uh, the scenes in the last couple of days. Really funny, a gender neutral scene that was just hilarious. Do you, do you write these? Yeah, yeah. Um, we started with a little pilot, which I think is floating around somewhere called Tall Dark Friend. And that was my old stage name. And then we just developed this, this character, this transgender kind of, the, the buzz phrase was always um, transgender people, are just people. Some people are, I, I don't want to swear on the show if I can't swear. Can. Some people are. I say trans people are just people, some people are dickheads, ergo some transgender people will just be dickheads as well. And that's the character. It's like she's not, it's not a over uh, hero if I had not a word. Uh, she's not a suffering saint. She's just a regular person that's a bit of a dickhead and I, right. I love it. Yeah, no, you play, you play a great a-hole. You really do. <laughs> 
Um, Thank but you she, very uh, much. See that she's kind. Like she doesn't have a bad heart. She doesn't actually want to hurt people. She probably just does along the way. It's just the way it happens. That's um, a really nice way of putting it. It's it, she's got an ego, but not at others' detriment. I think. Yeah, she, she loves her friend Tom. She really loves her friend Tom. Now, when you were on The Voice, uh, how did that come about? How did you? How many rounds? What? Where did you place? How did that happen? I uh, I had been performing for about five years, and programs like The Voice, um, despite the big queues that you see outside, there's not really a queue. You are contacted by the show, and they ask if you would like to participate. Um, so one producer round, and then you're on the television. You know, fingers crossed if things go well. And I managed to reach the semi-finals with a lady called Paloma Faith. She was my coach. Oh, okay. Sounds like a, who were the hosts? Were they we had uh, Boy George, Will I Am, uh, Ricky from the Kaiser Chiefs, and my coach Paloma Faith. Oh, okay. um, I think that was the only the only time that they had done it. I can't remember who's on the American one right now. Who do you, is it? Kind of a rolling thing. It changes constantly. Yeah, I don't know who's hosting it. I haven't really watched it recently. I used to watch it a lot when my niece, really? who I raised, lived with me because we would watch that together. But she's away at college now, so that doesn't happen as much anymore. So you don't have to pretend to enjoy it as much anymore. Uh, right. A That's lot fun. of it. Well, I liked yeah. watching people do badly. That's what I really yeah. enjoyed. I liked <laughs> watching people really eat it. That was my favorite. Um, when were you first aware of being trans? Um, were you very young? Was this something that happened when you were older? Or was, did you ever know a time where you didn't feel this way? Uh, um, very much the, the latter. I was, I was older. I'm now, I'm 32 years old now. And I think I was about 24 or 25. Before that, as a musician, I was very fortunate because in the liberal um, kind of atmosphere of the arts, if you turn up in some makeup and some sort of effeminate clothing, people just say, oh, that's you're just doing a character like David Bowie. So it was very easy, gradual transition into it. And then it was at 25 that I, I went to a doctor and asked them for some estrogen. It was there was a lot more to it than that. But that was the basic right. conversation. Yeah, yeah, I would imagine that so uh, it took a lot. Yeah. Um, in do you find that you get hit on by more men or more women or what has that been like? I would, I would think that the opportunity of dating would you double the opportunity of dating. Yeah, I'm a more versatile <laughs> uh, sexual prospect now because I, as a, as a entity, I have uh, boobs. I've got these nice expensive boobs that I've purchased. Uh, but I remain my original equipment downstairs. So what I've got is sort of, as I might have described before, sort of a Swiss Army sex knife of like <laughs> of potential things to use. So I and I'm married to a um, a lovely lady. Uh, we would describe her as a cisgender lady. I don't particularly use that word that much, but that just means she was born a woman and she's still a woman. Like she's got a womb and everything. Okay. <clears throat> um, but yeah, guys do hit on trans women a lot. You know what? Uh, I, I read recently that it's the most popular porn search for about the last three to four years. What that says to me is there's a lot of guys that feel very repressed and are unable to speak to trans women. And all of a sudden in the last few years, it's all gone crazy. You're like, yeah, just let's get amongst it. So I, yeah, sometimes. I worked at a porn DVD distribution center a year and a half ago. And there was <laughs> nice. a, an overwhelming amount of trans porn that was there. And I was always surprised, like people are still buying porn on DVDs, but <laughs> exactly. apparently because like people are being watched online all the time and they found that out after Edward Snowden came out, they, people started buying DVDs more. And what I found about the place and the movies was that some movies had great titles and then there were other movies that just had terrible titles. Like it would be like, one title would be like three guys banging a chick and then the other title would be Little House on the Harry. It was just like, sometimes there were clever efforts at literature, <laughs> like, but that, that was my experience. Um, have uh, the, the, the terms in porn that you have for trans people is such a spectrum. And I, I forget which ones are occasionally 
are considered quite offensive because they've been reappropriated by the community. So sometimes I'll hear a word, I'm like, I'm sure that word is only belongs in the realm of porn. <laughs> like, no, <laughs> that's what we call ourselves now as transgender people. It still doesn't quite hit my ears properly. So I, I, I think transsexual is all right. That's, that's a good word. I think it invokes the right spirit of what's going on. I think it does. I think it's a great word. I think that uh, what your show will probably do for the world will probably open up many more doors for people to do more, more television and film work like that. Or do you have any... That would be nice. Do you have any dream projects? Do you, um, do you do any film? Are you working on any film? Is it uh, something you'd like to do? I am. I have a, oh man, I, we're not sure if it's going ahead, so I can't tell you who it's about, but I'll let your imagination run. So I wrote a feature film. It's a superhero comedy about a character from the 90s, uh, a cartoon character from the 1990s <clears throat> that I've turned into a, a live action feature film. Fingers crossed that takes off. Things look quite good. My big dream is to have my own writer's room. I want to be Tina Fey, you know, I want to be yeah. Dan Harmon or, uh, you know, a, you know, God willing, I'd love uh, Childish Gambino's career. I'd love to write and star, but then of course have a flourishing music career that changes the way people think about politics. That'd be nice. Yeah, just, I mean, he did that with like one song. He was able to change. Uh, <sighs> bring, I, Amazing. Uh, he really is. Those are great uh, comparisons. Um, and uh, I really would like to know more about um, the comedy where you're from. You're in the South End. And we have uh, yeah. we have a mutual friend in Ashley, who Ashley Edwards, who Ashley Edwards uh, connected us. Yeah. And I think he said he was from the south. He he's in the South End now too. Or he, um, what is comedy like down there? Is there a comedy scene? There is such a wonderful scene. I'm inclined to think that seaside towns. I don't know what it is about the psychogeography. Maybe it's because we don't feel so, uh, uh, what's the word, claustrophobic because the ocean is right there. So everything's quite chilled out. They tend to have these flourishing little scenes like dotted along the coast that you can go from one bar to the next to the next to do comedy. Uh, we have a great, a great scene here, almost exclusively sort of run by our good friend, uh, Ross McGrain. Uh, he would love that I've said that as well, but he really does. He has kind of a monopoly on the on the comedy here. And it's a nice place to try new stuff. It's not easy, you know, it's great to have these places that feel like a bit of a baptism of fire. Um, it, one of my early gigs was here after I had some lovely gigs up in London, it was very safe and very soft landing. And I came here and I had to perform to people that not, they didn't, it's not that they just didn't want me there. They weren't expecting comedy to exist th this evening. So you have to get them on side and uh, it will always stay with me. I managed to win over some football fans uh, which is harder than it sounds as a transgender person. Um, not that you, that those are mutually exclusive. You can enjoy soccer and right. and still support trans rights. But these guys definitely weren't of that uh, that political persuasion. They they weren't happy that I was there. And by the end, we were friends. And it will always stay with me that memory. South End's been very good to me, comedy wise. All the um, uh, experiences I had with football players in England. I had to talk myself out of getting beaten up. It was usually on, on the underground on a Sunday. And it was like about two okay. o'clock when they were coming home from the games. And there was always, once the second they found out I was American, they would, <laughs> they would mess with me. I never- I wonder what it me. is, like, why? why, what is it? Do you think because you, you took football and you, elongated it and you you truncated football into this strange thing i personally prefer the spectacle of american football by miles i have to say and i think that we're sort of wimps about it if you look at rugby and you look at even soccer i mean those uh, to be a soccer player really you need to be really athletic to be a soccer player in ways that like you can get away without being athletic and being a baseball player for instance there's not much do that necessarily i'm sure baseball players would hate me saying that but but i, th I, th I think I, <laughs> since you brought up baseball i do like i, I think about this a lot so I, but when i moved from uh, music to comedy in my mind i've what i've done is i've done michael jordan in space jam where i've just moved from basketball to baseball and i still don't think people respect me for it and what i need is an animated cartoon to arrive in my life and convince me i should go back to doing music <laughs> 
I love that. Sort of like a fairy godmother, but a cartoon that sort of shows yeah. up. I think people are going <laughs> to check out this show. This is a really funny, really funny concept. And I know that I'm going to show people it. Um, if people want to see you or find out about you, uh, where, where can they go, Jordan? Well, you can always visit me across um, social media at Tall Dark Friend. It's too long of a story to explain, but Tall Dark Friend, Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. But if you want to check out Transaction, you can do so across Comedy Central UK's social media. That is a uh, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter, as I have just mentioned, and YouTube, of course. Um, but my name is Jordan Gray. Search me and you'll probably find sneakers. Because what happens is you get grey Air Jordans. Right. Scroll down a few pages and then you'll see me doing this. We're, we're going to change that. That's going to change soon. I really enjoyed yes. talking to you today. This was a really great conversation. You're a lot of fun. I hope we get to meet in person at some point. And good luck on your show. You are the nicest interviewer I've spoken to in quite some time. Thank you so much. Congratulations on the show. Uh, I hope it goes from strength to strength. And I, I wish you all the best in your future endeavours. Cheers. This is Welcome Back Thank to America. You. I'm D.B. Frick, and we'll be back right after this. Welcome back to America. As you know, this week we are back in England. We're going to talk a little bit about comedy out there. I have a friend here who I've known for almost 15 years, used to work out in LA together and at UCLA. Um, some of my favorite times were spent with this man. We were once on a, uh, on, well, we shouldn't even talk about it, but we, we, we were on a golf cart once that we probably shouldn't have been on. <laughs> Anyway, but we're not going to talk about that. It was just a golf cart ride. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. It was a great. It was just great. It was just beautiful, beautiful scenery. Um, this man also has a book we're going to talk about a little bit. Um, it's called The Importance of Happiness. Uh, it's a great book. Uh, I read it. Uh, I've had it for a few months now. It's been out there on the market. You've got to check it out. It's really, we'll talk a bit about that in a moment, though. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, comedian, actor, writer, Administrator, teacher, professor, baron, baron, admin assistant, count. You're a count oh, too. Sure. Right? What the hell? I can count. I, I took maths. I just retook my maths uh, high school thing. Uh, Elliot James, uh, one of my favorite people in the world. It's really nice to have you. Thank you for coming down to Welcome Back to America. Uh, thank, thank you for having me. Um, I, people say that in America. I um, hope they do. Uh, it's nice to be here um, on Zoom, um, and nice to see you, old chap. Yeah, 15 years, that's crazy. It's something like that. We, we met in like 2007, the summer of 2000. Yeah, UCLA, and we were going to be roommates, and in the UK, we never have roommates at colleges even. You always have your own room, so it was such a shock. It was a shock. Um, it was the only time that I had a roommate during my tenure there. Yeah, uh, we were the only and uh, uh, one uh, Javier once we had Javier. Oh, Javier snuck in. That's right. That's right. We had uh, we we had the same room for a while, but other than that, I always had my own room. Um, that was a great job. That was a lot of fun. A lot of laughs. Um, what I mm. learned about you during that job was, in part, one of the many pieces of you is your love of comedy, and your love of British comedy and American comedy. But we're oh, mostly yes. going to talk about uh, British comedy this evening. Uh, I'm curious, what were some of the first funny things that you remember? 
What are things that you would laugh at as a kid? Oh, oh my goodness. Okay. It's a memory test. I it is. It uh, is. I, <laughs> as a kid, it would have been, well, uh, we were laughing at the, like, probably the same stuff. Because I feel like the, the culture has become more and more homogenized, the uh, Americanized in the UK, probably start in the 80s. I think it really kicked in. It's carried on. Um, in the uh, 80s, so you were what, like in the 80s, popular shows here in the 80s were things like um, Knight Rider. Uh, oh yeah, that was my Heart favorite show. Heart, Heart to Heart. Do you remember Heart I knew, to Heart? I knew Heart to Heart, but, but, but Knight Rider was my favorite show. Was it a comedy? Maybe. No, I think if people watch it now, they might be like, it's a comedy. Yeah. It's supposed to be, no. I had the duvet cover, and this is an absolute true story. I... Um, I went, I used to like want to be different people. I definitely wanted to be Michael Knight. And I had a little black jacket. It wasn't even leather. It was just a little kid's black jacket. And I wore it. it wouldn't take it off for a whole week. And my mother had to call me Michael Knight or I wouldn't leave the, my bedroom. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's hilarious. I thought I looked exactly like him, except I was uh, blonde hair with glasses and didn't look anything like him. But, uh, yeah, no, he uh, he's beloved. He's uh, David Hasselhoff is someone who... Uh, is oh, yeah. well liked, and he did so much beyond that. You know, Baywatch, which also not a comedy, but if we watch it right now, we might laugh at. Well, well, Night Rider. I always think Night Rider got us through childhood, and Baywatch got us through puberty. You know, for our generation, that's kind sure. of. And he's one of those people that people who were like childhood heroes, you really don't want to meet them because you would just start crying or something embarrassing. You know, oh, especially now since they're all canceled. All my heroes. <laughs> I'm not even allowed to talk about them on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, did you know on, this is another comedy thing, you know, Harry Shearer and the Simpsons. I know you've watched. Oh many. yeah. I remember that launching on the Tracy Ullman show in 88. Right. Tracy Ullman, yeah. who's one of the greatest comedic actresses of all time. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think there's even any comparison, but on the Simpsons, Harry Shearer's, one of his characters was taken away and he's not allowed to do the voice anymore. Oh, yeah. uh, Dr. Higbert, 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 the black doctor. And he's was like, they cast a black man to do the voice now. And I'm like, oh my God. I mean, that character was never stereotypical in any way. It was more like supposed yeah. to be like Bill Cosby, but even Bill Cosby was a, a very whitewashed thing in the 80s. Yeah, yeah, but Bill Cosby, Played Bill Cosby, I guess, and sort he of was black. He was black, Bill Cosby. I think. No, he was, of course. I'm not trying to say that. Did you know that he uh, also he was a doctor. He was a gynecologist who worked in his basement. Is this the Simpsons character or Bill Cosby? No, this is Bill Cosby on the Cosby Show. Oh, was he? Okay, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> gynecologist who works in the basement. Oh, right. And and he's in, created that show in part. I just think that's important to know. We're not gonna spit that. That's important. Years, the character was taken away because of the whole, like the Simpsons yeah. doesn't want to play out any of those race cards. I did see that. I don't know how, I haven't processed it. I just saw that and haven't thought about it. I guess it's a huge change in casting from here on out. When I was a kid, at, well, when I was at drama school, as a teenager, the whole thing was you try and get as far away from yourself as possible to widen your range as an actor, but it's kind of shifting now. You have to tick some boxes if you're going to be able to play that part, I guess. And sure. I, I don't know how I feel about it because I think our generation is kind of, we're in the middle of perhaps older people who kind of go, oh my God, and younger people who are totally white woke, you know. And I think, I guess we're kind of in the middle, kind of just. We are. Bringing it out. Plus you were born in 1978, I believe, and I was born in 1977. So we're part yeah, of the will. same generation. Uh, yeah. We're closer in that way than a lot of people that I know in general. I know a lot of people that are much older than me and a lot of people that are much younger than me. Um, so yeah. it's having someone who was really was growing up at the same time. Like, did same you time. watch the, the Transformers or GoBots? Was that an influence? As oh, a yeah. GoBots was like the dollar store version of transformers yes. wasn't it it was yes. yeah but you still kind of had a couple of those toys and things just in case but, you had the poor friends we had poor <laughs> friends <laughs> we got the go bot okay 
<laughs> but I think it was a bit, and it was a bit like King Solomon's Mines was the dollar store version of Indiana Jones and all that. But yes, but that was Richard that's... Chamberlain. That was still Richard Chamberlain. Richard Chamberlain was still a great film. Who you met at UCLA at one point during, I mean, that's one of the great. Yeah, and I'm afraid there's nothing interesting to say because he was just charming and lovely. Yeah. And chatted, stayed for ages. And, uh, you know, great. <laughs> on the same note, before we go on, Christopher Bl Plummer died recently, as, <clears throat> yeah. as you know. Yeah. Um, he only did two musicals. He did The Sound of Music, and then on Broadway, he did Cyrano, which he oh. did in like the mid 70s, and he won a Tony. So he okay. got praise. He only sang twice, and he got praise for both those things. I saw him at a talk for the movie The Beginners in LA, yes. like it was 2010, and I got to ask him a question. I got to ask Christopher Plummer. Oh, I'm worried. I'm worried. What did you ask? I asked him if he was ever going to sing again. And he's like, I hope not. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> laughed. And then they oh, went on. Good. It was a really great moment. You gave him a feed line. That's good. That's good. You, do, have you heard of Captain Tom in the States? That little old guy who got to 100. He raised loads of money for the NHS by walking around his garden on a Zimmer frame. And he was trying to raise a thousand pounds and he raised 32 million. And he just died of COVID, so it's called kind of tragic. But when he and he was like a little tiny, could barely stand up, hundred year old guy. When he died, I posted a picture of him, and one of my friends said, "Oh, it's so sad about Christopher Plummer." <laughs> <laughs> but she wasn't joking. Oh God, <laughs> oh, God that's <laughs> oh, man. okay. That's that a lot. Funny. <laughs> now, growing up. Uh, we both had an affinity for Monty Python and the Beatles, which I became attracted yeah. to in the 80s. My sure. mother brought the Beatles into my life, and I think my father brought Monty Python into my life because it was being played at night on, I forget what channel, I think it was like Channel 13 for a while, PBS out here. PBS, right? right? Was the yeah. Yeah. So, I think that's right. Because Python launched in America like five years after it was in the UK, but and it was, over a, it, was a, it was a bigger hit there than here. The TV show, yeah. right? It was already over by the time it came over here. That's why the movies were able to be made because of the popularity that they had yeah. in the United States. Yeah. And when they made their first, uh, uh, now for something completely different, <clears throat> which people um, didn't, it wasn't really received well. Yeah, because it was just like the same sketches, but with a bigger budget. So they kind of already seen it, perhaps, I think. I don't know. And it didn't do very well. And I don't, I, it still came over here and was somewhat popular. But because they were able to put it into theaters, it was able to make a little bit of money. And then they were able to, to realize we like, we should do a story. Yeah. And, you know, that's when they you know, jumped on Holy Grail. The, the, the films, the narrative films are, are classics, I think. I think that's what really secured their like legacy and, the, and then, you know, surviving all these years and still being discovered, you know. One of the things that was very popular to do as a kid watching those, watching Monty Python as a child was to say the lines from the movies over and over again. Like yeah, oh, yeah. ad nauseum. With friends in school, is that something that? Yeah, same thing here. British school out in the countryside. Everyone, the Holy Grail's on TV the night before. There was only four channels, so everyone's watching the same stuff. And then the whole day is like I can't remember the quotes now. Um, your mother smells of elderberries or something. Yeah, of course, yeah. That's a very popular one. <laughs> um, or uh, the nights, the nights who say knee. Have you ever seen yeah. Spamalot? Have you ever seen a production of Spamalot? I have not. I wish I had. But I imagine it's pretty good, but kind of Python, but not Python kind of thing. But I, uh, I have seen Michael Palin five times since lockdown started. Why? I lived near, in North London, um, near like Hampstead and Primrose Hill, where all the like rich, famous people live. So I've seen him and, and I, I haven't said hello five times. It's a bit like the David Hasselhoff thing. Childhood heroes, you just just run away. Don't don't do anything. Run away. He's the only one I haven't met. I I met Terry Jones first at a signing. He did a signing with Douglas Adams. 
of a book called wow. Starship Titanic, which was also a video game. And Terry did the voice on the video game. He did the voice oh, of the parrot. Yeah. Which was just his, oh, you know, he just did that, that parrot. And that was the parrot voice. And got to meet him and Douglas had, there weren't that many people there. It was only like 40, maybe less. And it was a significant moment. Then I saw John Cleese outside walk, like in Manhattan waiting for a taxi. Oh, okay. And I got his attention because I was about to do an improv show. And I was like, I have to ask him to come. He's never going to come. But I asked him to come and he was like, no, I, I, I can't come. And the taxi came and he got in the was he nice? Was he nice? Because he famously refuses selfies and just says, I'm sorry, I don't do those. Yeah, I mean, this was 2000. This was 1999, 2000. Oh, okay. So yeah. there was definitely no camera involved. We selfie, yeah. Okay. And he was waiting for a taxi. You know, he was hailing a taxi to go wherever he sure. was. But he just got into his thing. So that was him. And then I was, go last year, Terry Gilliam, was supposed to come to talk about the Don Quixote movie. He was oh, wow. supposed to do it in New York City uh, at a movie theater. And it was planned for like two months. Two months it was planned. I was so excited. I had a friend yeah. coming with me who was a big fan of Monty Python. And, and it turns out for two months, the people who booked this gave out the wrong information. And the gathering was actually in L.A., but nobody showed up in L.A. Oh, my God. That's hilarious. So it's like Rudy Giuliani in the car park all over here. Sort of. So Terry was left, like, he probably showed up. I don't know what, but I, he probably showed up. And they were like, no one came. <laughs> no one came to the event. But we were <laughs> waiting in New York. And uh, there weren't even that many people there. That would have been a very intimate. That was one of, that was right before lockdown. That's a shame. This is why everything should be on Zoom. That would never have happened. No, but I have, I have seen him a couple of times, again, walking around here and on the tube, the subway, where <clears throat> I spoke to him because he was stood right there and he just wanted to discuss, discuss the design of an advertisement of some poster. And then I, I sure, I would engage on that with Terry Gallagher. That's right. I couldn't really speak. Oh, yes, it is lovely. And that was it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh god oh god <laughs> yeah no these guys we really I mean, we still look up to them and i got to see them when they did their last show in uh at the o in 2000 oh yeah i remember because i could i couldn't see yeah. that because i was stuck in l.a but yeah i was very jealous of that that was the last chance to see them really yeah that's never yeah. gonna happen maybe you'll but, see two of them together sometime but but what i regret is the michael palin thing i just want to like shout at him because he's like zigzagging on and off a path to keep his distance probably to do with covid and, and not wanting selfies and all that <clears throat> but i just want to shout at him put an effing mask on your 78. well he's not wearing a mask no, no one's wearing a mask in london it's nobody all... is not really not really me yeah in shops you have to obviously but once people get outside, like 90, I'd say 93.2% of people take the mask off on the street. If I'm outside and there are lots of other people, I have it on. When I leave my car, I'm wearing it. And for the store, I'm wearing it. But once yeah. I get back to my car, I take it off. I I, it looks like I'm walking, but there's no one on the street or in the park. If there's no one near me, I'll take it off. What's the deal with joggers in new york because i've been furious for a whole year with joggers well, well remember i live on long island so i haven't really i've only been to new york city a handful of times during during the year i mean i live a half hour out from it but um i haven't really been there much i did go to central park once and there was no one there no right. one That's cold what morning i was walking around alone it was like being in vanilla sky i thought i was dead maybe like there's a slight chance i died and central <laughs> park is heaven um, but Michael Palin not ma wearing his mask, that's... Uh, that's well, I tell you, I, I was going to say, actually, my biggest... And, and, and then I'll, I'll stop going about celebrity sightings. Oh, maybe, go on, go on. I saw, I think you probably, I'm sure you've heard of him, Barry Humphreys. Yes, of course. Lay Medner Everidge. This was early in lockdown, <clears throat> like the first month, the first lockdown last year. There was no one around again, up on the heath. And I saw in the distance a guy in, like, very, very bright pink trousers... Uh, pants, pants, I think you call them, and a fedora hat and uh, like a yellow scarf. And I saw him in the distance. Like, Who the hell is that? Is that Ian McKellen? It's Ian McKellen. As I got closer, it's Barry Humphreys. <laughs> and I went, oh, and I couldn't, I could have so easily said hello. 
And I didn't, because again, it was like, I can't, because he's been making me laugh since I was a kid and watched his TV show at my grandparents' house, you know. But Big that, laugh. That's the reserved Englishman in you. That's the reserved Englishman in you. And most people aren't going to, but London's different. Well, but you know, I did, but I thought he's such a hero that in the evening I sent him a message on social media saying something like, oh, I saw you, but I, 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 I was too in awe to speak. I just, and all I wanted to do was thank you for the laughs, you know. And then he replied. He keep on going back to that and being like, you haven't answered me yet. <laughs> no, he, he answered. He said, um, uh, uh, thanks, Elliot. I thrive on praise. I thought that's great. Yeah, no, I was just thinking he would probably be very excited that someone said hi, while at the same time, I guess, keeping their distance. And, you know, he's 86. And it turned out, because he put it on social media, that was his first time out of the house for a while, for a number of weeks. Would have totally freaked him out. <laughs> <laughs> and he had no mask on. 86, no mask. What's he <laughs> You can't even in the city in New York City, everyone's wearing a mask. I think, <clears throat> I think famous people or maybe rich people feel invincible. I don't know what it is, but uh, maybe there is something about it. I've never really had money, so I don't know what that. Me like. too. Yeah, um, but I noticed that what's that guy's name? Jeff Fauci or something said. Uh, where yeah, yeah, Fauci, the uh, the virologist, the genius virologist that a large number of people seem to hate. I know, but he said wear two masks. And I think, oh yeah, okay. And then someone suggested three. And now I think it's five. It's five masks and one of them has to be a Richard yeah, Pixar mask. Wear half a mask in the spring, just over one ear. I don't know. And you'll be like the fan of the opera. Or you had to share your mask with someone else who needed to go out. I, I'm all for masks. They keep your face warm, it's some sort of anonymity. I think it's great. Because you now, know the thing on the street, I think you call it a stop and chat. You see someone you half know and you have to say hello, but sometimes you don't want to. With the mask, you think, well, they probably won't even know it's me. This is great. We both have uh, another thing in common. We have a, a love of the Beatles. I'm pretty sure in England as a kid, you were issued Beatles albums. Or well, right at birth, you're given several albums of the Beatles. What happened for me was my father had all the records because he he saw the Beatles in 64 and he had all the original records and we were still playing them those originals on we still had a record player in the 80s it was just before they really died out completely and um so yeah they we didn't have cassette tapes it was all records and yeah and as soon as you listen to it as a kid there's just something magical about the whole Sgt Pepper album that you yeah. can listen to every song over and over again right it's amazing yeah. how that was it was the I think it was the symphony of it all. Yeah. That it sounded like this big party that you were invited to. It really was like a carnival. Even with the benefit of Mr. Kite, it sort of is, that's definitely a carnival, carnival feel during that piece, that whole album. Definitely. I was listening to the White Album right before we, we were getting, well, before we got on here. And I'm always impressed by how interesting those songs are. Oh, what, what's, what, what's on the White Album again? That's the last one they ever did, right? The White Album opens with Back in the USSR. Yeah. It has songs like Honey Pie on it and uh, <coughs> uh, Long, 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 which is a great song. It's been a long, long, long time. Oh. Just a sweet little Oh, song. I don't know that one. Okay, because I just, we just had Sergeant Pepper and I think Revolver, I think it was an album. Um, and then we had that big thing where they kind of re-released everything in anthologies in the 90s and then that whole thing. Yes, I think that's when it, I think my mother gave me a rock and roll music volume one and two, which was like Twist and Shout and songs that the Beatles were singing of Chuck Berry's and other people that they really looked up to. They were mostly a cover band at that point when they were those two when they were becoming really big in the beginning, they were doing right, a lot of right. covers of a lot of rock and roll songs. You got to meet Paul McCartney at one point, I believe. I That's did. I, yeah, well, I'm, yeah, technically I met him. <clears throat> well, there's two stories. My uncle met him first. My uncle used to have a, I don't know if I ever told you this, I must have done. He had a farm in the Kent countryside, uh, Uncle Albert and Aunt Rose, and they had at the front of the land on this little country road, they had like a big greenhouse where they'd sell like vegetables and plants to anyone passing the town. And back in the 80s, Paul and Linda McCartney were in there one afternoon. 
and uh, for ages just picking stuff up. And my uncle was a bit eccentric. You know, these, they, they must have known the Beatles, but they didn't have a television, all that. And he walked in there and said, I don't care who you are, buy something or fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. Well, treat them like normal people. And then I was on, I was in my drinking days, I was a little bit tipsy in North London. I just had a rehearsal for a play, got on the tube at Swiss Cottage, and there was no one in the, uh, in the, uh, in the subway train except me, Paul McCartney, and some lady friend. I don't know. I think she's like a woman he dated between wives. Um, and I, because I was a bit tipsy, a bit drunk, I went up to him and I think I just said something very cliche, like, oh, I love your latest album. <laughs> um, and, and then he, knew you didn't. He, know, he knows you didn't. He knows I didn't. And then I, and then I thought, it's Paul McCartney, I've got to touch him. So then I just kind of, like, <laughs> so then I just kind of like reached out and held his arm for like a second and then took it away quickly. I think I got away with it. I said, what? And I had that thing of, he's down here with no security. And you think of the whole John Lennon thing. So I said, uh, what, what are you doing on the tube? And he said, um, oh, it's cold up there. You know, that little head wobbly does, it's cold. So down here keeping warm. <laughs> and then I walked away and I thought, I've walked away, good little chat. He was fine. Walked to the other end of the tube, kept dignity, kept some dignity. And in London on the subway, you can see reflections in the windows. So I thought, don't stare at them. But I could see in the reflections that they were looking at me. I thought, why the fuck is Paul McCartney looking at me? And then when they got off the tube after just like two stops, I, I just went, I love you. Like that. Oh, no. That's great. Oh, God. <laughs> I love that. Um, but you yeah. met, did you meet him? No, I didn't meet him, but um, I almost did with family. They went away for a weekend in the Hamptons and he was on the beach and the story goes that they saw him there on the beach and someone wanted to take a picture in the group, like my aunt wanted to take a picture and she reached behind herself to get the camera in her pocket and like Paul like jumped back. It was like the mid eighties, late eighties. So, oh. and, but he, she just pulled out a camera and wanted to take a picture. Oh. And I don't think he did. I don't think he did take that picture. I believe. Uh, that yeah, I think he famously, because my brother said he was sat behind him at a concert once and he wouldn't do autographs because he said, oh, I'm like here with my family or something. You know? Yeah, imagine, but even at a, if you had a concert with him, imagine if he does that for one person, everybody's going to yeah, struggle. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I have some sympathy. And if you've been, you can't get more famous than that. And from your early 20s, when you're still developing as a human being, so, you know. The guy never had any kind of job other than playing music, really. Yeah. Like, I think, uh, I mean, I think he's as well adjusted as you could be. Sure, I, definitely. I like I, was, I think he's aware of that and tries to be. It's weird. It's weird. Yeah. Yes, he's, <laughs> a, he's a positive uh, influence. One of I the other things that I think is a positive influence oh, yeah? is uh, a little man named, a little man, a man named Noel Coward. And Elliot uh, wrote a book here called the. He, he was six. He was six foot tall. Yeah, no, he's a tall guy. I, I didn't mean to say little guy. Um, the importance of happiness. Um, it's all about a uh, actor's orphanage that Noel Coward ran and uh, uh, way back. Tell us a little bit about the process of this book, putting this book together. And sure. Um, <clears throat> have you done any readings? I would love to. Like, have you done any online readings of the book? I have. I was starting to do talks and I did one talk in late February 2020 and then that all shut down. But I've, I've had some Zoom interview or interviews and things. It's uh, I was um, I was in L.A. and I got very, very homesick. Um, so I ended up reading Noel Coward plays because, you know, that's the most British thing you can do, I think. Uh, and. I, and I'd been a huge fan when I was a teenager and I kind of got back into all that. And I started writing articles. I'd written some articles on theatre history. So I started writing articles about Noel Coward. The only thing that wasn't really known about him was that he was the president of the Actors' Orphanage, which was um, for, really for working actors, poor actors who um, ended up having a baby they couldn't afford because they had to stay on the road touring. 
So the kid would go into the actor's orphanage or for wealthy actors, famous actors that maybe had an affair and had a kid that had to kill. There was a little bit of that. No one knows about any of this. And Noel Cloud was very involved and raised money and made it better, evacuated them all to New York, funnily enough, during the war. So that article just became a book because there was just so much information. I tracked down a bunch of the kids who were now in their 80s and 90s, interviewed them. And, uh, and I think the book is full of um, heart and humor as well. Heart and humor. That's what I've gone for. Yeah, uh, no, it definitely is. It has a lot of, even the picture on the front, I mean, it's him playing music for a bunch of kids. Yeah. So like, I did just sort of wrote that another cliche, it just wrote itself because it was just, the, it, need, it was a story that needed to be told. And How long I did it take you to write it? On and off, four years, like mainly in the winters. And then I'd leave it for a while, come back with fresh eyes, have another go, or find some more information. Um, and then you do the whole thing with the copy editor and proofreader and all that. So I just did, I did the best I could. And I think it's okay. And I've had good feedback. And the main thing is I've had good feedback from the former orphans, well, orphans and former children. Right. right. Um, which is important. They've got to like it before anyone, you know. Yeah. It comes off like a great idea for a musical. I think we've talked about that a little bit. Or a Sunday night drama or something, but you'd have to get good child actors. Yeah, you would have um, to get good child actors. It'd be like, it's almost like it would be a different version of Little Orphan Annie. Yeah. Sort of. Um, and I, I like that. It's a, great, uh, it's a great concept. I keep on looking to the book because I, I think it's such a nice, it's a, it's a great thing that you put together. Once, it, yeah, it's out there now. And uh, I don't quite know how it happened, but it happened. And uh, now I need another project because that was my thing, you know, so I don't know. Is, I think Hal Prince, the great Broadway director, said that the best thing for finishing a project is having something else to go right into. Yeah. We get melancholy and, you know. We get well, I did. Luckily, actually, I did have something else to go into. It Good. was my, um, I think in the States, you'd call it a high school maths exam. I don't know what you call it over there. We I don't know what maths is. We have, what, what kind of position does it get you? You know, like math, high school math. Oh, so you're going to do your math teacher? I, no, I, I'm going to do teaching a bit of English on the side, but to teach English over here, you have to have your high school math. And, I, and, I, and I'm terrible with math and numbers. My, all my teachers were not literally escaped Nazis, but to all intents and purposes. Um, so they put me off the subject. And, uh, and then I've spent the last 25 years not even working out bills in restaurants, just picking them up and going, oh, yeah, I don't do numbers. You'll have to work that out. <laughs> and then to teach English, you have to have a maths qualification. So I, that's what I went into after the book. Oh, my God. I think that's true. So you're going to uh, I think that's true here, too. You have to be you have to pass a certain amount of math classes. Just your basic um, educational stuff. Yeah. So that's stuff. you can teach at the grammar school and high school level. Yeah. Yeah, and, and build from there, hopefully. So I'm just, because of COVID, I'm just trying to put things in place in case there's another pandemic. Because if you're a teacher, you can always teach online, right? So Yeah, no, we both did. I did a little bit of teaching too. I taught, and, we taught, and we taught drama. and I taught uh, a, uh, an improv class and a film class over the summer to uh, students. That was interesting to play it out like that. You um, great improv teacher that's the i think that's the only thing i've seen you teaching but you were absolutely fantastic i appreciate you saying that um i i am amazing it is you are, yeah i mean we talked about i'm glad we brought that up um <laughs> uh now in the last minute that we have before we close i want you to tell people at home where they can go see you how can they find the book okay okay sorry i was panicking then every time there's a question i'm always worried <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah, well, probably the best place is the, the uh, website, www.elliotjames.net. Elliot, two L's, one T. Because uh, then it's all on there. The book link is on there. But the book, really, The Importance of Happiness, you find it Amazon, Barnes & Noble. You can just Google it. Um, and, uh, but my, uh, yeah, uh, my acting show reels on there, all that. And uh, that's probably the best place. Um, but I'm hoping, I don't know what they've said in the States, in the UK, they're saying we should, 
be ebbing out of lockdown April, May, basically back to normal by June, hopefully all being well. Yeah, I'm thinking about the same thing, August. Well, That's then there might be some talks, but the talks will probably be in England because I'm not sure when international travel will be allowed. That's like the last thing to happen, I guess. Uh, one of the last. And I look forward to the opportunity to coming back to England at some point. It's been too long. Yeah. Yeah. Elliot James, thank you so much for coming down to Welcome Back to America and chatting today. I always love conversation with you. It's been great. I think we went for like 45 minutes, honestly. Oh, I'm so sorry. That was long, wasn't it? I'm so sorry. No, no, I loved it. It, was, it went fast. I think the audience <laughs> will agree. So we will uh, stay with us right after this and uh, stay tuned for more on Welcome Back to America. Thank you, Elliot, for coming down. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, au revoir. Au revoir. Goodbye, farewell. Thank you ever so much. Au revoir is English. <laughs>